Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and to follow Lida in her presentation of uh, the Janis Lipkin Museum. I think um, there are some similarities yeah. between us and perhaps that's why I follow your presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, not only because we are also the one of the winners of the Kenneth Hudson Prize of the European Museum Forum. Uh, we did so back in 2017. But I think because we are also dealing with quite a number of uh, issues uh, concerns of the present, of the past, and not only. Um, obviously, um, to be a good museum, to be good is not just enough. And uh, this is one of the ideas that was advocated by Kenneth Hudson. You have to be more than that. Uh, you can't just be good. You have to challenge the ideas, the traditions. You have to create new approaches. You have to create your own traditions. And uh, I think museums like um, the Janis Lipke Museums and so many other museums that are recognized uh, by the European Museum Forum and not only uh, do so very well. Um, I hope that in one way or another we um, are also one of such institutions. Um, one of my colleagues recently uh, compared our institution, which is the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Museum and the Boris Yeltsin uh, Center to um, Noah's Ark. We built something that uh, we didn't know how to build we um, had no idea where we were going. We are still sailing in this um, kind of sea of uncertainty, and we do not know where and when it will end. Um, I think in many ways, we are in this process of still uh, discovering what we are and uh, what we're going to be. But anyway, the process has been started. Um, in sum, um, we are the first and the only currently presidential center in Russia. I do not know if um, any or many of you have heard of us, perhaps someone. Um, if I may, I will show um, a quick video. I'll start it, but then I would like to, well, I thought maybe I would have it as a background. Yes? No. Now there, there. Google's wrong. wrong. That's all right. Yeah. No, it's going. Well, I think because it's showing from the internet, it's not very um, good in quality, but. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of what we are. We are a very large, multifunctional uh, center, uh, a public space, a cultural center, um, a community center now. Um, and we work not only as a museum, but of course museum is um, at the core of our presidential center, but um, much more than that. about another 10 minutes or so. Can I lower the volume somehow? Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, so as I mentioned, we are the first presidential center in Russia. We um, opened in late November of 2015. Um, so we're about three and a half years old right now. Um, besides the museum itself, we also have um, a library and archive, which are the other two components that are required by law, um, and um, a number of other platforms that we run, including an educational center, a film center, a congress hall, a um, number of open public spaces where we do um, exhibitions, including, for instance, our art gallery that we predominantly use for contemporary art shows. We um, do um, have a lot of spaces that we convert for um, a variety of uses, starting from uh, workshops, master classes, uh, meetings like this, for instance, today, uh, to many, many, many other things. Um, as I mentioned, uh, back in 2008, uh, the federal law was passed. Uh, it was, it is called the Federal Law 68, which was signed by 
then new president Dmitry Medvedev, who just recently stepped into his new role as the president following uh, Vladimir Putin's first two terms. Uh, the federal law uh, was titled on the presidential uh, centers of heritage, um, on centers of historical heritage of presidents of Russian Federation who cease to exercise their authority. This is kind of the, uh, the official uh, title of it. And uh, it was meant to provide the legal base uh, to establish the public institute of presidential centers in Russia. Um, there was no such president before. Um, uh, we uh, basically became at the forefront, um, kind of at the avant-garde of uh, uh, this idea. Um, and uh, uh, soon, shortly afterward, the world began on actually conceptualizing what a presidential center could be. And of course, my colleagues um, followed uh, a lot of the expertise, knowledge, and uh, experience of other colleagues um, um, abroad, uh, I mentioned um, already today, the presidential libraries in the United States, for instance, which is an institution, a public institute that uh, has been around for more than half a century. Uh, there are other cases, similar cases around the globe. Uh, in France, for instance, now also in um, other um, countries, uh, former Soviet states, former communist states. Um, however, we from the very beginning envisioned it as something completely different as uh, something maybe, in a sense, revolutionary, something that uh, will challenge the idea of what a public um, institution could be and the impact that it could uh, have on the society around it, on the community of the, that um, uh, is around it, but also um, in terms of the transformation of the cultural uh, landscape for the country itself. So, um, as we're speaking about governance today, um, I would actually just like to cite some of the things that are provided to us by, by law and that we must follow uh, in terms of furthering our mission, which is, of course, uh, um, the preservation, the studying, um, the public presentation and the publication of the legacy, the historical legacy of the first president, but also of the ideas of democracy, of uh, building um, a new democratic state, um, the state of, of law um, and the rule of law. So, um, in terms of furthering this mission, um, by law we are required to do a number of activities. We um, have an archive which uh, hosts uh, doc documents that um, are relevant to that period of transition of Russia from the communist state to the democratic state um, that relate to uh, the building of um, the new country um, and um, materials that um, obviously closely follow uh, first president's career and uh, his work. We um, create, store, preserve, um, and publicly present uh, various objects, which are museum objects, uh, which um, are not necessarily uh, historical documents, but uh, present, um, again, the historical legacy of the first president, but also of uh, um, our country, of Russia, in the uh, global context. We um, have a library, uh, which is um, another key component to what we uh, have and what, how we work. We um, carry out research activities, we do publishing, uh, publishing our own research and uh, our own findings, but also um, a number of uh, works by our, our colleagues. We organize and conduct conferences, symposia, briefings, roundtables, meetings, um, and by law we are required to actually have some participation from um, official bodies and from prominent figures um, of, um, um, of state. Uh, we conduct cultural and educational uh, programs, and uh, you could actually see some um, of them, including some, um, well, at least in Russia, well-recognized figures. We establish awards and scholarships. Um, some of these prizes uh, actually are in the name of the first president, but they uh, are not required to be. Uh, for instance, uh, we run um, a number of literary prizes that we inherited back from the Yeltsin Foundation, which uh, started back in 2000. Um, when Boris Yeltsin actually retired from his post as the president of Russia. We um, carry out, of course, charitable activities, and um, a lot of it, uh, in a way, transpires from um, this video. Uh, a lot of the activities we do, we actually fundraise. We raise funds that we uh, later donate to other foundations and to other causes. So it's um, at the heart of what we do, um, bettering the society and helping the community around us. And not only. By law, we are also uh, able to conduct business and commercial activities. Um, we are able to hold real estate and uh, we are able to um, do activities that um, actually 
support our goals and uh, work in furthering um, of our goals that uh, I have already mentioned. Of course, all of these activities, including and particularly the commercial and business activities, are strictly governed, controlled and audited. And um, we try to uh, be as careful as possible because in Russia, well, uh, you, you want to be. Um, the center is uh, by law established by the administration of the president and by the president himself, the president who has stepped down and uh, has ceased um, uh, exercising his uh, presidential authority. However, if the president is uh, no longer among us uh, you know, following the death of the president, it could be the administration, um, uh, the presidential administration, uh, in alliance with the heirs of the president who form uh, the actual body. Uh, they form the board of trustees and uh, the governing body of uh, the center. So um, as such, um, and um, as it is now, as it stands now, our official founder is the administration of the president of Russia. Um, however, we um, also have quite a number of other individuals on the board of trustees of, um, of our center that include appointed members who are appointed by uh, state, by the uh, administration, and also by um, by the heirs who are part and members of uh, the board of trustees. So in a sense, uh, this is a kind of um, emerging of the uh, several different systems. Um, on the one side, it's rather official. On the other side, it has a very personal and immediate touch. Uh, we are extremely lucky to have our founders, uh, the daughter of Boris Yeltsin and also his widow, Nagina Yeltsin, with us and actively involved in all of the activities and uh, work that we do and uh, um, activities that we ra realize at the center itself and uh, well, well beyond that. Um, be besides the Board of Trustees, we also have a number of um, kind of managerial bi bodies that are required uh, by law. Uh, that is the auditing committee that audits our um, financial well-being and um, our overall um, activities and making sure that we are in compliance with law and all of the regulations. We also have the research council um, which um, strategically um, forms our uh, research uh, processes but also uh, supports um, the educational programs that we, that we run. Um, as I've mentioned, many of um, the programs that we have were in fact initiated back uh, before the center was formed. So back in 2000, when Boris Yeltsin retired from his uh, presidential post, the foundation was formed uh, that um, had in, in its mission the realization of charitable uh, causes. And that included, again, the literary prizes, athletic competitions, support of people with disabilities, uh, inclusivity and um, um, and other, I think, important social causes. So we have um, inherited a lot of that and wrapped it into the program that into the programs that we run. Um, in the spring of 2009, it was decided that Boris Yeltsin Center would be located in Yekaterinburg. Yekaterinburg is the place where Yeltsin um, spent most of his career. This is uh, the home base for for the family um, and. Uh, it was quite appropriate that it would not be in Moscow. However, by law, um, any center, and I'm sure there will be other centers, presidential centers in Russia, uh, that is not located in uh, the capital, will also have a branch uh, in Moscow to establish a presence there. So we are actually in the process of uh, building our branch um, in Moscow right now, but it is all surrounded with controversy, um, financial issues, and um, a lot of things that have been put and imposed upon us. Uh, we're hoping to resolve it, um, and uh, hopefully in 2000, and now no longer 20, but 21, we will open a full uh, function in Moscow branch as well. But the uh, Yekaterinburg uh, Center opened in November of 2015. Um, a number of um, um, key figures uh, were present at uh, the opening of the presidential center, including Vladimir Putin, Dmitry Medvedev, who was at that time already in the uh, post of uh, the Prime Minister, uh, obviously the widow, um, many other former heads of state and uh, representatives. Um, and it was actually a, a large and significant cultural event for the country itself. Um, since the opening, we have received 
uh, quite a number of visitors. Uh, you have seen uh, some of the crowds, but we uh, actually visited the key core uh, permanent exhibition um, receives about 250,000 visitors per year, while the center itself, with uh, all of the other activities that we run, um, we estimate around a million visitors per year. However, this number has been steadily growing um, as we are actually also getting better at counting people who attend our programs. <laughs> so, um, and also actually, of course, um, uh, gaining more experience in terms of what we're doing, how we're running it, and um, how it is performed. Um, as I mentioned, we, uh, of course, relied on the experience of other uh, similar presidential libraries or cultural centers around the world, but I think we are doing um, more than that. We uh, support a lot of uh, programs that promote democracy, that promote uh, social dialogue, and that create, um, I think, a healthy debate on um, the issues about the past, of course, uh, but also the present and the future. How am I doing on time? <laughs> um, so just a few words about the museum itself and the um, exhibition. You might have seen a couple of uh, slides there. Uh, the museum is not just about the figure of the first president of Russia by far. Of course, we look at the contemporary history of Russia through the prism of um, uh, his life, uh, his political career. But we uh, really have it as um, our goal to study the contemporary history of Russia, its political history, particularly the last turbulent uh, decade of the 20th century, and how it um, affected us. How it affected uh, us not only then, but how it also affects us perhaps today, and uh, maybe also in the future. So we go through um, a number of uh, turbulent um, series of events uh, in our exposition, which was I think well curated and designed by um, um, by a prominent team um, of designers. Um, Ralph Appelbaum Associates won the tender for uh, the museum design for the design of the exposition. However, they were also joined by a number of Russian um, um, team members. Uh, Pavel Lungin, who is a famous film director, uh, in fact created the conceptual um, kind of idea for uh, the core exhibition. Uh, it being seven days, seven uh, key moments in the history of Russia of the, of the 1990s. Uh, we had a number of archivists, politicians, uh, journalists, uh, those who were in the midst of the events uh, participating in gathering the material, um, analyzing it, and uh, trying to create um, a coherent representation of that rather difficult time that we are very much going through a re-evaluation re of. And um, uh, it was very important to have um, a clear statement, but also an open statement. Because uh, for everyone, I think, that goes through our permanent exhibition, um, it is very much the experience of um, establishing your own history of that time. Reliving it through your own memories, reliving it through your uh, own stories, and constructing this kind of mosaic of um, uh, the history of that period that is not just single story, but rather multi-storied, um, so for us it is key, and there is not one um, single answer, of course, to um, a question. Uh, there are many different perspectives on um, even uh, seemingly uh, clear events that uh, might have been covered by uh, so much media. Um, there is quite a lot of debate about all of that uh, happening in Russia <laughs> at the moment. Uh, the highlight of our exhibition is uh, the final gallery, which is called the Freedom Gallery. There is a beautiful painting by a Russian emigre artist, Eric Bulatov. Um, he was one of the uh, key figures of Sots Art Movement. Um, it is a bold statement about what the museum represents, um, and freedom as uh, kind of the uh, key core idea and theme of uh, the period of 1990s, uh, the struggle that we fought for um, the struggle that we fought and um, the idea that um, seems to be rather elusive. Um, Freedom Gallery for us has become this place of debate, um, of uh, discussion. We do a lot of public programs there. Uh, it is now a symbolic place for it. Um, uh, there are, of course, public programs, including for children and adults. We do a lot of uh, events for people with disabilities. Um, you might have seen a couple, including even theatrical productions that we do with them. Uh, performances, dance performances, mu musical concerts, all of that just happens now on a regular basis. But it all had to be put into uh, motion as we started our work. 
Um, in fact, um, it has become this um, kind of place of um, um, idea and a symbolic place uh, to a degree that even Russia's bid for uh, Expo 2025 took place at the Freedom Gallery. We unfortunately lost, but uh, it's going to a very uh, good place in Japan. Uh, anyway, still, we, uh, we host a lot of international um, uh, events still, uh, such as, for instance, the Assembly of the Council on Human Rights, uh, UNESCO meetings, and we do a lot of activities with the international um, institutes. Uh, we uh, have um, 12 official diplomatic missions in Yekaterinburg and 11 honorary uh, missions, so we actually Despite the fact that we are not able to um, openly uh, receive foreign grants, uh, we um, in fact have an opportunity to, to um, create a very comprehensive and complex uh, program of international um, events, including film screenings, including uh, lectures, including uh, meetings with uh, artists, writers, etc., etc., etc. So, in a sense, we. Um, I, I wouldn't say that we have achieved it yet, but we are in the process of creating this um, space, public space for dialogue, for discussion, and perhaps a debate uh, about a lot of um, issues, not only concerning the past. Um, understanding your past, of course, is important, but uh, without raising um, and connecting, uh, raising the issues and connecting it to the present, uh, it would it would lose its uh, meaning. Um, so we we try to do that. Um, let me just say two words about the criticism, similar to uh, what Lolita has been um, uh, describing in terms of the attention that the Janis Litke Museum receives. We obviously have um, a lot of um, uh, those who uh, use us as a cause for, um, uh, for, for public discussion, let, let me put it this way. So, uh, practically since the opening of the Yeltsin Center, we have had um, a lot of uh, attention uh, drawn to us. We have been accused of um, some incredible things. There's been protests happening outside of our doors. Uh, m less so uh, recently, uh, more so in the first year, as we were really trying to kind of uh, set the roots and uh, establish our ground. Uh, the National Liberation Movement, which is a, kind of a nationalist um, uh, movement that has emerged in Russia has been um, one of our key opposers. Uh, prominent uh, filmmaker Nikita Mikhailkov has, um, who has a TV show that uh, is very successful and uh, popular, has uh, featured us in a number of his programs, and uh, we have even been one of the topics for a uh, presidential press conference for Vladimir Putin back in 2016. Um, Less so now, however, still, there are uh, many of those who come and oppose us, many of those who kind of try to uh, stir up um, um, some public attention around what, what we do, um, those who accuse us of deliberately judge, juggling history, or as Mikhailkov said it, daily injections of destruction of people's self-consciousness that are carried at our center. Um, <laughs> well, um, I, I of course could argue with that, but I hope that the video that you have seen shows that we are not injecting everyone, we are actually um, uh, doing quite the opposite. Um, the Yekaterinburg branch of uh, all Russian parental resistance, as it's called, um, complained to the prosecutor's office back in June of uh, 17 that we were uh, exhibiting some explicit um, material in our art gallery. This is something that happens quite a lot actually now. Uh, we were once accused of uh, showing a film in our film center uh, that we did in partnership with the Swedish uh, Cultural Institute that um, suggested uh, some teenager sex, uh, so we were also accused of that. Uh, back um, around that same time, another discussion started to happen about the fact that uh, in our core permanent exhibit we have um, a small exhibition that relates to the establishment of the new trade uh, back in the early 1990s that has a um, couple of bottles empty of course of uh, alcohol and uh, some empty cigarette packs uh, as a historical representation of what a commercial uh, kiosk might have looked like. Um, we also then of course accused of the fact that our restaurant sells wine and beer um, because why should it? <laughs> um, and uh, other similar and such, such matters. Just uh, so you are aware, um, 
there was an, another interesting case in March of this, of this year. Um, we received a letter from the prosecutor's office uh, asking us to explain why we have uh, Nazi propaganda exhibited our, at our museum. It in fact was the uh, Order of the Three Stars, the uh, Latvian National Order, uh, that of course does not promote Nazism in any way, but uh, in fact has one of your uh, national symbols incorporated into it that um, to some might appear as uh, replicating or uh, being similar to uh, the Nazi swastika. Um, um, there are several petitions on change.org that um, are trying to close us. Um, let's see what happens, but uh, hopefully not. Uh, just two weeks ago, we held a public talk on um, the stigma, the stigmatization of uh, LGBT, LGBT plus people. Uh, we uh, were very careful with raising this talk, uh, but um, we have had previously a series of other discussions on stigma. We have this program that we started last year that, that is called Bye Bye Stigma. We talked about uh, people who have been released from prison, um, uh, people with HIV, AIDS, um, people who volunteer. Volunteering is stigmatized in Russia. <laughs> um, and uh, so finally, we have had the courage, uh, I have to say, to hold this talk on LGBT plus, uh, five minutes into the discussion, uh, we received a phone call with a bomb threat. We had to evacuate the entire center at 9.30 in the evening. Uh, it was around 1,000 people. It was a slow night because it was Tuesday, but um, can you imagine, it was 1,000 people, uh, visitors at the restaurant, visitors at um, many of our other um, spaces, uh, those who were touring the museum, uh, even school children. So uh, that, of course, lasted several hours. And to a degree, I'm, um, I cannot say that I'm happy about what happened, but it certainly raised awareness about um, the issues that we must address, not just at the Yeltsin Center, but uh, us as a society. And uh, uh, the conflict that uh, arose then with the parental um, organization, with the religious fathers, um, in a sense, continues to be. But I very much hope that the investigation will actually help us find uh, the person who um, who caused the evacuation. <laughs> well, in sum, uh, the Boris Yeltsin Presidential Center is a non-profit organization that promotes the institution of the Russian presidency and the development of civil society, democratic institutions, and the rule of law. Uh, we do that, of course, uh, in accordance with the law and following strict regulations that are imposed over us. We also see it as our mission to open a debate not only about the tumultuous past and the difficult transformations that we as a country experienced back in the 1990s and at the end of the 20th century, um, but we also uh, look at the establishment of the new democratic state. However, this discussion would not be productive if we do not address also the issues and concerns of the present, and uh, we all know that no future is possible without knowing your past. However, we must also recognize that it would not be possible, it would not be possible, I mean the future, if we do not try and challenge our present. And as a museum, um, it is one of our challenges to challenge it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Difficult. <laughs> Difficult, uh, perhaps one, one short question. You, you wouldn't have moved from New York of all places to Siberia if you liked it. Um, yes, in fact, I've moved from New York where um, I used to work at the Museum of Modern Art uh, for almost eight years, seven and a half. I was um, a liaison to the Board of Trustees there. So in terms of uh, the topic of today's discussion, I could uh, say a few words about how it is run, uh, let's say, in um, the United States in uh, non-profit and public institutions there. But of course, uh, <laughs> it is the challenge that I um, very much welcomed and uh, um, accepted uh, transferring to Russia. Uh, Yekaterinburg is located not in Siberia, it's in the Euro region. So in a sense, okay. we are also it's close to... <laughs> <laughs> we, we are a little bit closer. However, um, the border, the um, this imaginary border between uh, Europe and Asia runs just about uh, 20 kilometers uh, away from Yekaterinburg. And technically, Technically, uh, we are located on the Siberian, on the Asian side. However, um, I think the city very much sees itself as um, an international hub now. We um, do not say that we are off Europe or off Asia. We have a lot of uh, contacts, including, of course, business and corporate, um, I mean, as the region and as uh, the city itself. 
uh, both with the, with the West and with the East, and uh, it's an interesting mm -hmm. place to be. Well, it, it sounds like an interesting place to be indeed, and uh, uh, one, one perhaps small question to you. Well, when I think of um, democracy, it is unlike culture or arts history where you can uh, a few years ago ship Elgin, Elgin marbles to the 500, uh, no, 250 anniversary of Hermitage to, you know, to tighten the uh, diplomatic ties. Uh, democracy is something that, uh, you know, it started from the Universal Declaration. But I guess that being in a place like Ekaterinburg or Russia, it uh, requires some um, relativist or situationist attitudes to develop. Mm -hmm. And, well, I, I wouldn't go into details, and we have public discussion later, we can touch upon those issues. I was just wondering if museum ethics is something that can save us, <laughs> keep in the same boat, and you know, unites us, unites us internationally. Not only here, as we just talked with Lolita. Um, well, I know why we're here. We're here to discuss the um, judiciary and uh, legislative changes that are about to happen in Latvia. Um, I have to say that in Russia, these issues are run even deeper, and uh, there is an ongoing debate about how museums should be run, how um, this. Um, museum community is constructed and what our joint goals uh, should be. We um, have an annual conference that uh, is actually coming up and I would, I would love to invite you all um, into a museum that happens at the um, end of May. And uh, there is a lot of issues that start to come up um, in our conversations that we hold uh, generally once a year as a large group because everyone from uh, Russia tries to attend and come and join in this conversation. But of course this is an ongoing uh, debate. And to a degree, I feel like um, we at the Presidential Center have been uh, lucky to be privileged enough not to be um, under the umbrella of so many changes uh, that um, um, kind of brewing up in the Russian system because we are, as I mentioned, a different kind of organization. We are an independent uh, public um, foundation. Uh, we um, report to different entities, to different authorities. Uh, as opposed to uh, the other museums that um, exist in Russia. But um, there is, I think, a general sense that uh, we are working together to improve the situation and uh, to uh, make it better, and uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Right, okay, I think we move on.